Can you hear me? Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Welcome to listen to my presentation about Kayak 3D engine. My name is Veli Pekka Piiran and I come from Kajani University of uh, Applied Sciences. First, uh, agenda, small introduction about me. Then I will tell you very briefly about game development uh, studies uh, at Kajani University. And then very briefly introduce uh, Kayak 3D game engine and show some videos about the games made with Kayak 3D. And then my colleague Mikko will present new game technology degree program. And at the end we will have a small panel discussion with some industry specialist, uh, Jouni Mandonen from Mountain Sheep, Jere Sani Salo from Housemark, and Teppo Soininen from Umbra Software. So, uh, basically I started to teach programming at the university and uh, founded then the game development education at, in Kajani. I started with uh, lecturing game programming and uh, became head of the game development lab. And uh, now my main task is uh, international partnerships <laughs> development. And I also started as a part-time studio manager in Supercell North. So Supercell founded a studio in Kajani uh, in the beginning of July. So I will part-time lead, uh, lead the studio. So it's easy to say we are number one in game education in Finland because we are the only one which is educating, uh, let's say, we have a full degree program for game education. We take about 40 students per year, and uh, students can uh, special, specialize themselves in five different disciplines, game producer, game designer, game artist, game programmer, and we have a new uh, discipline, game engine programmer, there too. Our education is very practical, so there's uh, uh, about 30 percent uh, practical uh, classroom teaching. So it means that uh, our students uh, have classroom teaching and lectures only on Monday and Tuesday and on, and on Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. They just make game projects. And the uh, cycle is that uh, they have to release a game uh, in a half a year, one game. So in autumn and in spring one. So aim is that our students learn to make games very practical way in a game studio environment because the learning results, uh, results is much better or are much better than in uh, traditional way of teaching. And also our students uh, aim to publish their games. So that's why Mostly we start with the mobile games because they are most easy to make and to publish. And there's also good channels to publish your game like App Store and Android Marketplace. So students have possibility uh, also to earn a little bit money because if the game is successful, they can get something. And that's why our students have uh, founded a company inside the university called Kayak Games that they can run the game development business in a small scale during their studies. So this way of learning means that they are much more ready to go in the game industry than in normal when studying in a normal university. And we are pretty international now. We have many partners in Sweden, in UK, Ireland, Belgium, Netherlands, Thailand, China and Taiwan so far. And I'm building also now a partnership with South Korea and Malaysia, Japan and Scotland. So our students uh, are very eager to go uh, abroad as exchange students. We have now five students in Thailand, Bangkok in Rangsit University, learning mostly uh, game graphics. 
and uh, four students are going now to Belgium. And uh, last uh, autumn, we had uh, two students in China and uh, two students in UK and uh, two students in Thailand. And uh, uh, this year is also one guy going to UK. And three Chinese art students are coming to Kajani to study game graphics and game art. So that kind of environment is where our students make their games. So it's mostly team working. So about game engine, uh, it was originally planned uh, to be a game engine for smartphones when we started. So uh, that time we started 2000, end of 2008, and uh, and and uh, it is based on OpenGL, uh, ES, and it's made with uh, C++ using specification of uh, this Java specification specification requests, mobile 3D graphics. So there was some kind of specs already that we used. It's not 100% compatible with that, but we used it as a base. And uh, it supports PNG uh, 2D graphics and uh, M3G 3D graphics file formats. So it's multi-platform game engine. Uh, it also supports the PC and Linux using OpenGL and uh, iOS, Android, also Samsung Pada and uh, Nokia Mimo. This is of course dropping, dropping away. So two most important platforms are iOS and uh, Android. And uh, I will show you a video that you can see the portability. Here is a game made in uh, Global Game Jam in two days. So very small game in two days.
uh, it supports uh, physics engines like ODE, so Open Dynamics Engine, Bullet, and Box 2D. And for 2D uh, level editor, a style map editor, and Lua for scripting. And it also has uh, editable particle systems and uh, Octree based visibility optimization for 3D. And originally, Engine was made for teaching purposes at Kajani University's game education that students can make easily games for uh, mobile devices. And here's some examples about those games. So this game is coming to uh, uh, iPad tablet too, and uh, on 3D game. Some small examples about the games. And also, I don't have videos about them, but there's also many more. And it also has a Kinect integration, so here's a video about it. Okay, 
So, about the future of Kayak 3D. So we have started to support, or we have now starting to make development that the game engine will support uh, high-end PC game simulation applications. So for uh, better shader supporting, asset pipeline and tools for the uh, engine. And we are using OpenGL for, for that. And uh, we are going to make this engine as an open source version uh, and our uh, goal that it will be released end of September. Using uh, LGBL licensing, it means that uh, you can get the source code, and, and, but if you make any changes in the engine, you have to release also the changes. But we can also give a PSD licensing for our partners, so who is our partners or company or an, another university. We can give with using BSD, so it means that you don't have to release anything. And of course, we would like to have or see some kind of community development arising around Kayak 3D because there's big need of better tools for it. So if you are interested, please contact me. And uh, that's my presentation. And Mikko will continue about the new game te technology degree program. Mikko Rampainen, and uh, I'm going to tell you something about uh, our new degree program of uh, game te technology. So basically, game technology studies are engineering degree speciali uh, specialized for game technologies. And our main focus is at uh, 3D graphics programming and uh, game engine programming. Uh, in the studies, there's also some physics programming, physic, uh, making of physics engines, and of course, uh, using physics en engines, and uh, some network programming uh, things, and uh, AI programming, and most of all, level, low-level programming, so multi-threaded and uh, memory management things, and lots of things like that. How to optimize your code. <coughs> so, if there's so much engines and middlewares on the market, so why students should uh, study how to make game engines? Okay, first of all, it's uh, quite, quite good to know what's happening under the uh, hood. So, basically, uh, it's nice to have information how to, for example, OpenGL works, or, and of course you need to make some shader and shader code and things like that. And for example, now when we have a WebGL, for example, then you need still to do the uh, basic things there because there's no ready uh, engine for the WebGL yet. So when the new technology will come, you need to know the basics that you can use it. And uh, we have also noticed that uh, in the industry, there's also lots of need for 3D application or 3D game programming. For example, simulators, uh, medical applications, something like uh, X-ray, showing the X-ray pictures. Of course, 3D user interfaces, natural user interfaces, things like that. And uh, of course, industry data visualization, for example, machine vision applications and things like that. So it, it's much easier to show the data in 3D format. Okay, content of our studies consists of uh, common engineering studies, came te technology uh, study modules, and uh, project study, uh, studies. So basically, at first year, uh, there's uh, at autumn semester, there's common studies. And uh, after uh, winter, at second semester, there will be starting game technology studies. And uh, project studies are one day per week. 
because there's so much uh, common studies and uh, things like that. So only one day per week is uh, reserved for projects. And second year, there's two days of project uh, studies per week, and there's common studies and uh, game technology studies. And third year, there's mostly basically uh, game technology studies and uh, on sec second semester uh, students will go to practical training for a company. And uh, fourth year is uh, for thesis work and uh, project studies mostly. Okay, so what's the common studies for engineers? So there's lots of math. Uh, because math is the, all the basic things you need when making 3D. And there's also some physics uh, and some electronics because we also uh, make some embedded system programming. And of course, communication skill, English language and things like that, and uh, basic programming. And in game technology studies, uh, we learn uh, 3D math, uh, quaternions, more matrix calculations, things like that. Uh, of course, uh, 3D graphics programming, software rendering, and of course these OpenGL and Direct, DirectX APIs and shader languages. Some physics and uh, engine architectures, how to make game engine, network, AI, and of course techniques uh, regarding the so-called serious games augmented reality, simulators, natural user interfaces. So here's the process of the project studies. So basically the idea comes from company, student or some teacher. And he will uh, dis uh, describe the idea and then the student will can ha select from the pool of ideas what, what you, would you like to do. And, uh, then there's, uh, it, uh, he will start the project and uh, uh, make it, and uh, then we share the project. Uh, so basically, all the re reporting and things like that, it will be shared for the future use. Uh, what about, what, what's good things in uh, project studies? So basically, students can make what they want. And that gives them motivation, and from the good motivation and doing actual stuff, it's a good way to learn, so, and pleasant way to learn things. Of course, from project studies, they can have real uh, working life contacts, and it's a good time to make them own, own things there. Uh, customers will get uh, cheap or almost free manpower, and of course, they can train the uh, stu uh, student for their company tools and things like that, if necessary, if, or if they want. And for us teachers, it's a quite radical change because uh, previously we were knowledge transfers. So basically what we know, we transfer that knowledge to our students. But nowadays, uh, we are only mentors of self-improvement, so basically, uh, we provide some support for them that they can learn. So, <coughs> and of course, uh, typically students will become know some things better than teacher itself. So teachers also learn from students. Okay, so there's lots of need for 3D programming in the future. Uh, and we will start uh, degree program for uh, game technology in autumn 2012 and uh, for different for common engineering studies is that we learn uh, teach lots of uh, 3d graphics programming and uh, other there's also other modules for game related technologies and a huge amount of these practical projects for making own stuff and things like that. Okay, thank you. If you have some questions regarding the, so you can uh, send me an email and I or some improvements or things like that. And you will.
you will find us uh, at our booth in the on the first floor. But uh, now we have a uh, time for panel discussion. Welcome, Jouni, Jani, and uh, Teppo. I have a couple of questions for you. So we have here a couple of mics, so you can switch them when needed. So first, please introduce yourself. Okay, hi everybody. My name is Teppo and I'm from Umbro Software. I've been can you hear that? Is the mic on? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I've been previously working at NVIDIA and um, Hybrid Graphics before starting Umbra Software. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Jere Sanisalo from Housemark, and uh, I've been uh, the lead programmer for Superstars HD uh, and uh, Dead Nation games for the PS3. Hi, I'm, <coughs> I'm Jouni Mananen from Mountain Sheep, and I co-founded a company called Hybrid Graphics back in the day that became NVIDIA. But now I'm uh, with Mountain Sheep, we made Death Rally uh, for iPhone and the Minigore game for that. So small games on many platforms. Okay, so my first question is that there's a big amount of game engines, commercial open source game engines in the market. So does it make sense anymore to make own game engine? It makes sense to use any, everything that's out there without settling for the compromise that you get or would get everything from one single engine. Because if, when somebody in Sweden makes a great engine called Unity and give it to people, they can't make a special compromise for any single title, any single developer. So it will fit everybody, but it will not be the perfect one for anybody. Yeah, no, uh, and also there's the important point that what really is a game engine, uh, because uh, a game engine is basically, well, one way to look at it is basically a collection of different things that you pick and choose from, for example, rendering, physics, uh, some support for logic, and so on. So I would actually say that you can use the parts you find. If they fit your game, then use them. But I think it, 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 it always makes sense to customize on your own needs. So I agree with Jere a lot on the <coughs> fact that basically it depends on what you're doing. If you're working on a really simple iPhone title that really needs specific stuff from you, say, I don't know, you're doing Zookeeper, it's completely overkill to license Unreal Engine for that and so forth. So it really depends on what you need and get the components you need, if you need any, that is. So depending on what you need, if you're doing a huge AAA first-person shooter title, there's CryEngine and Unreal Engine there, it definitely makes sense to at least look at these engines and see what they can do before investing like 10 years of development to implement your own version of the same engine. Uh, so. What kind of uh, game engine would you recommend for a startup who would like to make iPhone game or Android game? That would abso absolutely depend on the kind of title they wanted to do. And again, the title then should depend on the uh, kind of engines they have available or the kind of skill sets they have. So it all begins not from a choice of an engine, but the choice of a compromise. If they want to make a first person shooter, then I would absolutely recommend the Unreal Engine over anything else. Does it work on iPhone? It does actually work yeah. on iPhone now. Yeah. So good. And I, I actually think that Unity is a, is a good choice if, if you have nothing and you want to start from something. And it's not overly expensive either. Like Unreal tends to be a bit on the expensive side for startups. Yeah, Unreal actually isn't uh, apparently that expensive for iPhone. But for iPhone games, I'd definitely say that it depends on what kind of <coughs> content you're working on. If you're doing like an Infinity Blade type of an type of a game that's really content heavy, you need 3D graphics editors and stuff like that, go for Unreal Engine or something like Unity or something like that. Or if you're doing an Angry Birds or Zookeeper type of a game that really doesn't actually need anything but a couple of textures and stuff like that, the content tools are not that important, then it might be that Unity and these game engines are a little bit overkill. You might waste more time customizing these engines that you would actually spend on building your own engine that would suit your purposes. Uh, about the need of 3D graphics programmers, uh, do you think that uh, we are in the right way that we start to uh, teach 3D graphics program? Is there that kind of need as we are thinking there is? If, if there had been programs like this to teach students practical game programming and engine programming, uh, I wouldn't be a high school dropout as I am now. <laughs> I don't know where that would have led me, but I know that personally 
if I had had the choice of a program like this when I was young, uh, I would have taken it. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I kind of have to say that uh, when interviewing uh, programmers for our company, uh, there tends to be a lot more 3D programmers than gameplay programmers. So it kind of feels that there's an abundance of 3D uh, programmers on the market, so to say, but not that much uh, people who know how to well organize gameplay specific code and gameplay architecture. Yeah, from my point of view, when interviewing programmers for, for example, Umbra software, I don't really care specifically what you've been coding or anything like that, as long as you've been coding. If you've written like half a million lines of code, you're probably pretty good at whatever task you undertake. So just code a lot, that'll make you good. Yeah, actually that was my next question, that if somebody really wants to be a 3D graphics programmer or game engine programmer, what do you recommend uh, him or her to study by, by herself, himself? Or I, I would go with what Teppo said. Uh, by doing programming, you end up being prepared for most of the challenges that come up with any platforms that you even haven't seen before. And even, even 3D graphics, it's not that far at the end of the day from, say, database programming, where you need to get a lot of data from one place to another, filter it by the uh, relevant stuff, and put it on the screen. So, you know, there's just a lot more pixels, there's no words, and it's still just uh, being able to describe the challenge that you have in the application to the computer in a way that the computer will behave correctly. And practice that and you'll be successful. Yeah, I, I actually am a strong, strong believer of, of learning by doing. So uh, just by doing lots of games and trying to get them really finished, uh, and then perhaps later uh, expanding on them, then you quite often hit all sorts of uh, snags uh, on, on your own design and that way you gain an understanding on how, how the game engine architecture uh, would, be, would, ha would have been better if you would have done it in a specific way. And it's really hard to teach actually that type, uh, type of stuff because it all comes from uh, experience and a bit of gut feeling. Yeah, as Jerry said, it's like the iteration. It doesn't really matter if you're studying some something. You might do the same friggin' algorithm or same whatever you're doing. You might do it like 10 times. But once you bump into that kind of a problem, you're pretty good at like recognizing the problem and knowing the solutions for those problems. And don't spend your time learning APIs by heart. There's API references all over the place. The APIs change annually and so forth. So it doesn't really matter whether you know OpenGL4 or OpenGL2 or DirectX, whatever. As long as you kind of like adapt to the API and learn to read those API manuscript manuals and just like go with the flow. So, <clears throat> if you have full power to improve education in Finland in game technology or in game development, what would you like to do? Well, that's an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that they should make more games. And the games should be reviewed and rated as if they existed in the actual industry, which means that a half-made game is not a game as such. So uh, I, I like your approach of having the students actually ship games, because that is the point where you define whether you've actually accomplished anything or not. Yeah, and, uh, well, I actually kind of think that uh, the choice of uh, smartphones is a good one, because uh, there, there are a lot more limits on, on phones and consoles, and and uh, that 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 type of specific thing is is, is a good thing. But I I'm not sure how how to, how to improve on that, really. Perhaps you could have a chat with Sony or Microsoft guys and gain some access to real dev kits for 360 or PS3. That would most likely help help as well because there are there are a lot different types of limits on consoles than on mobiles. Yeah, I agree with the other that like doing different types of platforms. Whatever you do, you just like doing only Windows programming really kind of like derails you from the actual fact that n you don't always have unlimited memory. You don't always have practically unlimited processing power on the CPU and so forth. So it really makes a lot of sense to use these limited devices and actually try to think how to get the best out of your whatever small memory limits there are and actually 
quite frankly, I think iPhones and that kind of stuff, they're almost as powerful as PS3 is like on memory wise and like graphics processing wise. So they're really like, when you think about it, they're really kind of like at least on the same ballpark as like current generation consoles. So that's not a bad way to get your like way into actual AAA type of game development or at least the same problem domains that AAA game developers try to face or face daily. So Finland uh, ha has a strong reputation about or in technology and in game technology. Every, almost every company has own game engine. So how do you see the future? Uh, are we, is Finland dropping out and losing the game? Or are we more st or stronger in the future? Well, you can look at the um, leading charts on small downloadable games. And on every chart, on every platform, several of the titles are from Finland. Uh, obviously, Angry Birds biases the results a fair bit. But at the same time, I, I believe that we were told so many times by Nokia that it'll be a billion dollar business just next year. And next year, next year, mobile games and downloadable games will be the billion dollar business. And now it is a billion dollar business, but it's not Nokia, but everybody was sort of prepared for it mentally. So Finland's not dropping out. Rather, we are seeing that even when some larger studios were shut down, when uh, Universum was acquired by uh, THQ and then shut down, now there's 10 game companies in Tampere instead of one. So. It's, it's an organic process. Finland is really just getting started, I believe. Yeah, and I, I actually believe that technology is only a tool to make great, great games. So uh, in the end, it doesn't actually matter how well uh, we uh, fare at the technological front, just as long as we make good games. And so far, we're doing pretty well. There are like more startups than, than ever now that I'm actually having difficulties keeping track of all of them. So uh, I, I, I don't think, well, I, I kind of think that right now we're in a good place, but who knows when our uh, recession hits in a few years, what happens then, but we'll see. Yeah, as Jera said, there's a lot of startups and so forth. And uh, talking about the game engine, everybody, uh, game engines, everybody develops their own technology and so forth. That's how it's been all over the world. And Finland is a small country. There's not, there's not a lot of game development happening here. But for example, Rovio has now licensed a Unity engine. They're starting to look into third party stuff. Remedy has licensed our technology into Alan Wake and so forth. So there's naturally like Finland follows exactly the same trends as the rest of the world, but we follow them in a smaller scale. Being a five million person people nation, we definitely like the trends are a little bit funky over here, but basically the same trends can be seen. Okay, we have time for one or two questions from the audience. Do you have any game engine or game related questions? Nobody's with, oh, there's one. Do you have a mic? Uh, yeah. Hello. I'd just like to say um, about the uh, WebGL thing that even if you, of course it's good to know low level stuff, but if you uh, were looking at, oh, were watching uh, Mr. Doob's presentation uh, yesterday, there's the engine 3 double, uh, 3 GS, JS, uh, which is really good for WebGL development. So you don't have to start from zero. Just wanted to uh, put this out there. So, yeah. Okay. There was also another question. Somewhere, yeah. Um, what kind of things you wanted to say to person who would like to learn uh, game design, but he has no friends and no no to start off? What kind of things you want to say him to get it started to be game design? I have a very easy solution to that. Uh, there's an IDGA night every month. You can make friends in the industry and uh, talk to them just show up, nobody's asked to prove that they are in the industry. And especially on, I believe on the 9th, there'll be a, like Tuesday, there's an IDGA picnic. Game developers will actually go outside and uh, hopefully drink some beer and it's an opportunity to network with the industry. It doesn't matter whether, whether you're a student or somebody who's interested or somebody who's just showed up wandering into the park, but you know, everybody's welcome. And currently, I think uh, the game design is one of the hardest disciplines out of all of the game 
related things to get into uh, because well not that many are actually required per project and there are some people with many years of experience already on the market uh, but I kind of uh, kind of feel that uh, by starting out with something uh, different design related like making levels and mods for things like Unreal Engine uh, that, that's like the perfect way to get started and you can pretty much do that on your own without any friends and and the tools are free actually so yeah, it's like basically what Yere is saying kind of like what I reckon is game design is a really broad discipline in the sense that you have level designers you have gameplay designers you have interaction designers and you have whatnot there's a huge load of stuff that you can do and the guy who can't remember the guy's name the Finnish dude who made crayon physics the guy who's doing games all the time Petri Puru. exactly so he's he's a good example of like a one-man powerhouse of doing game design really actually relevant game design on like these super casual games he pushes them out really quickly so for example you can if you don't want to try to learn super complex tools start with flash for example that's a perfect tool for doing easy game design try and game design concepts like gameplay ui design could be somehow like interaction design or whatever like you could try these kinds of stuff out really easily by just like for example doing flash or even something more simple game maker you don't need to program <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you guys give a big hand to our panelists and uh, last word, I put my Supercell hat on and say Supercell is hiring, hiring so visit Supercell booth and also Kayak booth so you will play our students' games. Thank you very much. <laughs>